This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, hi there. Pull up a chair, a couch, even the floor maybe, I don't know, just relax. All the latest ag news right here, right now. So glad you can join us. I am Ray, he is Kenny, and this is what you call the rundown. Absolutely, off we go. Coming up, what do you think are the main issues affecting Georgia farmers? Everything, right? We'll take you to the annual Ag Issue Summit in Perry and hear how state lawmakers are working to solve those many problems. Also on the program, a history lesson in agroforestry, how it helped save the farming industry in the 1930s and how it continues to help farmers protect the environment. Plus, this might look like your typical video game, but believe it or not, it is a unique tool that is helping to raise awareness for agriculture. Ray sits down with an Appling County man who's become quite the expert at it. These stories and so much more start right now on the Farm Monitor. With a number of concerns facing the ag industry, everything from natural disasters to market prices, it's important for policymakers to meet face to face with those that are being affected. That's the purpose of the annual Joint Agriculture Chairman's Ag Issues Summit, which was recently held at the Georgia National Fairgrounds in Perry. John Holcomb was in attendance and has the recap. In just over four months, state legislators will be returning under the Gold Dome and kicking off the 2022 session. Just like with every year, there are a number of ag issues they're hoping to address this upcoming session, which is why the annual Joint Agriculture Committee Chairman Ag Issue Summit is so important as they discuss issues within agriculture with ag industry leaders and professionals. I think it's very helpful, especially as uh, chairman of Senate Ag. It helps me understand what's on people's minds and what's on their radar as far as how what's affecting the farm and how uh, the Georgia legislature may be able to help uh, grow agriculture. Agriculture is our number one industry. One, one in seven jobs in Georgia uh, are connected to agriculture, so we want to keep it green and growing. Of the several ag issues they discussed, one big one was right to farm, a major topic of discussion the past few years that protects property rights of farms. The last couple of years we've worked on what's called the right to farm legislation. We do currently have protection for farmers on the books in Georgia against nuisance lawsuits. So if your neighbor moves in uh, and you've been an existing farm operation and they move in next to you and want to sue you because of the odor from your farm or the noise from your farm or dust or light, uh, we have protection under Georgia law currently against those type of lawsuits. However, recent federal court rulings have proved that the laws may not stand which is why it's at the top of their list to get something passed that will stand up against unwarranted lawsuits and keep Georgia agriculture protected and viable. Farming is a huge, takes a lot of capital to farm, a lot of investment. Um, if we want somebody to commit two, three, five, ten million dollars into a farming operation, they need to have some certainty in the law as to what their protections are. Um, in order to make that kind of investment. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to uh, work hard and work out a solution to this to make sure that what was passed in the 80s to protect Georgia farmers and the intent of that is carried forward uh, in light of the, the recent court ruling. And of course, that's just one of the many issues facing the ag industry they plan on working on in the upcoming session. As far as the 2022 session, Again, we'll be talking about the right to farm, but we're going to be looking at maybe some tweaks to our, our water policy with regard to irrigation wells and in the Flint River Basin. We had a, a speaker uh, on that today. Uh, we know we need economic development in rural Georgia. We know there's a, a workforce shortage in rural Georgia. These are the challenges we'll be trying to address as we go forward. Reporting in Perry for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. They might be small in size, but peas take a big effort in order to get them from the field and into your kitchen. However, one operation that has been perfecting the process for decades is Calhoun Produce. Damon Jones takes a look at this family-run operation and how it has evolved over the years. 
These machines will be running day and night for the next couple of months as countless orders of peas must be filled on a daily basis. And getting them shelled and into the bag is just a small piece of the processing. Well, the peas are hand-picked. So uh, they pick every day. We start from June through October. So we have a summer crop and a fall crop. Um, and when they come in from the field, sometimes it's during the day or later at night, uh, we shell the next day and um, we shell all day long. So we have all different varieties. Uh, we go from pink eyes, cream, zippers, white acres, lady fingers. So we have a big variety to choose from. While the taste might not be much different from variety to variety, the presentation is. And with each consumer having their own preferences, having an array of choices is important. You can have the pink eyes, and sometimes we have black eyes and crowders also. They make the dark soup when you cook them dark broth. And then you have the lady fingers and zippers, uh, creams, white acres. When you cook them, the broth is, is clear broth. And so everybody likes something different. So that's why we have a big variety. One of the reasons they are able to process so many peas in such a short period of time is the machinery that has really evolved over the years. My daddy helped design them back in the 80s, and uh, he come and we are always tinkering with them. Uh, he had for years to get them exactly how he wanted them. Uh, we used to have the uh, single shellers where you poured the bushel in one at the time, but uh, we outgrew that, and um, we just needed a way to make it more, um, you know, continuous. With so much product going out the door every single day, it's not easy to be accountable for each bag that's produced. However, that responsibility is a major priority here at Calhoun Produce. We have a food safety program. We do GAP here, so uh, we have a sticker on each bag that leaves here. So it can, we trace it back. If you need to trace it back, we can to the field, the crew that picked it, when it was picked, everything about that bag of peas or butter beans that leaves here uh, because we, we have a food safety program here. So we're accountable for everything that leaves and we can account for everything that leaves here. Sustainability is also paramount to this operation as they use every bit of the products they grow. We have a uh, trash belt that runs through the whole packing house and it runs to a dump truck. And we feed our cattle. We run about 100 head of cattle and they chase after the truck. They love the hulls. So, you know, there's no, nothing is wasteful. As for why it's beneficial to make a trip out to the farm to buy your produce instead of the grocery store, it's really quite simple. But right here, it is fresh shelled. I mean, they were growing, you know, the day before and they're shelled. So it's straight from the field to the farm and then to your table. So it is really fresh. Reporting from Turner County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. After the break, like so many of you, he gets paid to farm. However, his fields and equipment are virtual, and he has got quite the following. More on Baxley, Georgia's Harley Han when the Farm Monitor continues. Welcome to Ag Lab. Today we're going to look at agroforestry. Agroforestry is a combination of agriculture with forestry, just like it sounds. In other words, it's when trees and shrubs are deliberately planted on farms with livestock and crops. Agroforestry has many environmental benefits, including preventing erosion, increasing wildlife diversity, sequestering carbon, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and even providing natural materials for biofuels. Did you know that agroforestry helped save the U.S. farming industry in the 1930s? During that time, erosion, droughts, and dust storms wreaked havoc in the Great Plains area, from North Dakota to Texas. President Roosevelt and the U.S. Forest Service implemented the Prairie States Forestry Project, which involved strategically planting trees around farmlands. This enabled farmers to protect their crops and homes from the disastrous conditions of the Dust Bowl period. Trees from this life-saving agroforestry project still stand in many of the former Dust Bowl states. Today, there are five widely recognized categories of agroforestry. Alley cropping is when food, forage, or specialty crops are grown between rows of trees. Forest farming is when high-value specialty crops like herbs and mushrooms are cultivated under tree canopies. These tree canopies provide shelter and shade for the crops. Silvopasture combines trees, forage, and livestock animal grazing. 
Riparian forest buffers are strips of vegetation made of trees, shrubs, and grasses that are planted alongside rivers and streams to reduce erosion and runoff. Windbreaks are trees or shrubs specifically planted and managed as natural barriers against wind, dust, chemicals, and even odors. All five methods help ensure we have an environmentally friendly and sustainable practice of farming, which will keep food on our plates for years to come. ARS researchers across the country are helping growers and ranchers introduce and improve agroforestry practices on their lands. In Fort Collins, Colorado, we're researching the effects of windbreaks on soil erosion as well as their overall potential as conservation tools. In Ames, Iowa, we're studying field windbreaks impact on soil carbon and nitrogen cycling. And in Tifton, Georgia, we're using riparian forest buffers as a tool to trap sediment and nutrient runoff from agricultural fields. You can find more about agroforestry by visiting our website and searching for agroforestry. We look forward to seeing you next time on AgLab. Let's face it, if you're a Generation Xer like myself, you've seen video games come a long way since the days of Pong, Space Invaders, or even Tech Mobile. Nowadays, simulators are the rage. The graphics so real that if you're a farmer and don't feel like heading out to the field, you can just hop on your computer and get your farming fixed that way. In fact, I spent some time with an Appling County man who, believe it or not, is raising awareness for agriculture by tooling around in his virtual combine. What's going on everybody? We are live here today with some Farming Simulator 19 once again. Bill, good morning dude. Terry, Michael, Dave, good morning guys. Meet Harley Hand of Baxley, Georgia. In the video game world, he is what you would call a professional gamer. Yes, Harley earns a living playing video games. And this electronic wonder is his office. Given his game of choice, plus the fact he lives in rural Georgia, one would assume that Harley has an ag background. Well, that is not the case. I grew up in a town that's like nothing but farming, but other than that, I've never done it. <laughs> other, like my parents, whenever I was little, they had a garden in the yard, so that's about the closest thing I've ever done to any farming. But you'd never know it listening to one of Harley's daily Facebook sessions. He can speak the language of ag with the best of them. We just bought a ton of cows the other day, a ton of pigs also, so. We're going to have a lot of farming work and animal work to do on top of all of the mining work that we do here. And with over 40,000 followers, some of them real life farmers who pay to watch Harley lay down a sprinkle or two of virtual fertilizer, he's managed to tap into a whole new audience who, like Harley, knew nothing about ag before playing the game. Got lucky really when I started because it was right before the uh, pandemic started. So a lot of people were at home and it, uh, I was at 30,000 followers before the year, you know, my first year, and now we're at 43,000, so, but um, the game has it's come a long way. Indeed it has. Now in its 12th year of publication, the Farming Simulator series has reportedly sold over 25 million copies combined, in addition to 90 million mobile downloads. Its developer, Giant Software, goes to extreme lengths to ensure the game is both fun and realistic as possible. Yeah, so it's also, in my opinion, really important to, to tell the people that farming is, yeah, a lot more than we tell in the game. In our game, most of the things are really simplified to, to um, make the game enjoyable, and so it's, so it's fun playing it. And also the Precision Farming DLC aims also for that, that fun so it's also a bit simplified, but yeah, tells the people that it's more than, than a simple process that farmers are doing out there. It's the draw of being able to do stuff that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Akia Ramming, senior editor at Enthusiast Gaming, has been reviewing the Farming Simulator series since 2017 and says he isn't surprised at how popular the game has become. He also enlightened me as to why a person would pay to watch a gamer like Harley farm from the comforts of his computer room. The draw of it is, I would say, a lot of their personality. They tend to have very friendly personas, and so they make you feel like, you know, like that's my buddy, you know, even though you don't actually know who they are. <laughs> and so it's that factor, plus, you know, you're getting to watch them, and because they do it so often, you may want to emulate their style, you may want to emulate you know, their gameplay formula to get a similar experience as to what they're showing. Yeah, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and, and um, 
they just ask a bunch of questions about farming or, or uh, you know, they, they start wanting to play the game and learn themselves and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. I've never reached out to farmers other than just talking to the few that are in my stream that, that farm themselves. But um, I definitely, it has sparked an interest. I've looked up videos to see, you know, try to compare it to the game, see what, you know, what differences I can find. And I've definitely, uh, you know, wanted to, to go work on a farm for a day or two just to see what it's like and, and use it, you know, record it as well for content on the stream. Oh, somebody help that man out. We want to see him drive a real tractor. Well, up next, this lady here, she is the real deal. In fact, she's credited with helping to create Georgia 4-H as we know it today, honoring Diane Davies after this. Finally this week, from our friends and partners at UGA Extension, the incredible story of Georgia 4-H legend and innovator, Diane Davies. From 1979 until her retirement in 2002 and beyond, Davies' contributions went beyond the borders of Georgia. State 4-H leader Art Smith saying, quote, Davies' contributions to 4-H inspired others across America to enhance outdoor learning opportunities. Diane Davies, the Georgia 4-H Lifetime Achievement Award recipient for 2021. I think the reason she was so successful is that she had a passion for, for the work. She in, really loved nature and the out of doors, uh, but she also wanted to tell the story of the science of the out of doors. And I think she had such a passion for science, and nature, and education, and she was able to put all that together. When I think about it, the trait that Diane has, I, I, I think of vision. I think of her ability to see what's possible and then to put legs on it and make it happen. She's a very much of a hands-on person. And, and you, a lot of times, a hands-on person doesn't necessarily have the vision and the capacity to bring complex things together. But Diane has both. I could see what this program potentially could become. But I also knew how to put the wheels underneath it. And it's one thing to have vision, but it's also another thing to know how to put the wheels under a program and make it work. When I was first hired, Tom Rogers said, look, this is an experiment to us. We've never done this before, but I'll give you six months to see if you can make the program work in an annual budget of $300. That first year, uh, I think they served 2,000 people. Uh, the difference in 2,000 then and 40,000 today, it was just Diane by herself. And uh, she wrote the curriculum, she did the delivery, she taught, uh, she managed everything. I did not want the Georgia 4-H Environmental Education Program to be considered frivolous by the schools. I knew that it needed to be integral into the education of children. So what I did immediately is I tied our Georgia 4-H program from the very inception to the state school curriculum because I wanted the teachers and the principals and the superintendents that I was trying to convince to have them bring their students out to Rock Eagle to experience this program, that it would enhance what they were doing at school. The first schools were mostly private schools. So when the public schools came on, that gave us a real strong indication that we had a program that's going to rapidly expand. The value of relationship building really is the foundation for this program. And when I would see the school buses roll in, even before the end of the school year, I knew that we were building a partnership with the schools. Diane's success in the program, a great deal of it is her relationships. But it was all about her selling this program, selling Georgia 4-H, selling education, selling this outdoor classroom. 
and the importance of relationships. Spending time and investing in people, recognizing where there's opportunities to grow relationships. With the teachers, with the schools, with the personnel, with the on-site staff and the seasonal staff, all of it forms a basis of relationships so that you can take a program from its inception through its growth and then on into the future. And you can't do that without building relationships. I had this dream of one day having a Museum of Natural History at Rock Eagle. And so it just started with an idea. Diane achieves so much during her career with a Cooperative Extension in the 4-H program. And it's hard to point to any one thing and say that uh, this was her greatest achievement. But, it, but if we're sitting here at Rock Eagle today and I think about the development of the Museum of Natural History. I knew when I gathered together the ideas for the exhibits that more than anything, I wanted the Natural History Museum to be a window to the world. And we had children from many of the rural areas around here. And when they would first walk in the exhibit hall and they saw the Mosasar, it was like their jaw would drop and they'd never seen anything like that before. And what a wonderful opportunity to get them excited about paleontology and everything else. They'd go around the corner and they'd see something else and it would lead to all this discussion about archeology. span And it was just a wonderful, wonderful resource for our program. We talk about, you know, $77 million and one and a quarter million people that have come through the program, and that's one in 10 Georgians, if you want to look at it that way, that have been impacted by the environmental education program. If you look at it from the standpoint of the individual child, and let's take a child that lives in Atlanta, lives in the city, uh, their opportunity to come to an environmental education program, get in the water, look at plants and how the, all the environment fits together. Uh, that's a very special opportunity for the young people. We had so many students that back at the school, I mean, they were, they were considered problem kids. And we would convince those teachers to bring that just type of student with them. Don't leave them at home, don't leave them at school. And the one that's so clear in my mind were the two students that went down to our Jekyll Island 4-H Center. These students had never seen the ocean before. They had never experienced the marsh. They learned so much and they were so excited about their learning. When they left, they told their teacher that they wanted to become marine biologists. And both of those students went on to become marine biologists. I can't think of a more deserving recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award than Diane Davies. Diane is so deserving of the Georgia 4 H Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm so proud of the fact, Diane, that you're the one that was chosen. You will walk with the giants of the Georgia 4 H program. I mean, I've been very fortunate to receive many awards throughout my career. But this one is really special to me because it is from my family of 4-H. And so it has great meaning for me when those that you work with recognize the value of your work. It is extremely exciting and I am so appreciative of this award. All right, what a story. Our thanks to UGA Extension for producing that and for allowing us to show it to you. And of course, Thanks to you for making the show possible. Before we send you on your way, a friendly reminder that for all the latest ag news regarding food, recipes, and what's happening on Georgia farms, be sure you check out all of our social media platforms, including farm-monitor.com. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of agriculture and with us right here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.